record button. Uh, there it goes. Um, Weird. Uh, I yeah. would have thought that Dirk and I would both have been hosts and that either one of us could push the button, but apparently not. I pushed the button. Ah, okay. You have, okay. okay. I didn't realize it wasn't going, but the icon on the screen makes it look like it's recording. Yes. Okay. Then okay. Uh, it's good uh, at least it is now finally recording. <laughs> Sorry for the delay. Thank you. Okay, he touched the sound. Okay, so anyway, who shared the slide? You shared the slide or I no, need to... Uh, uh, you are running your slides uh, yourself, so uh, you should share your... Control to share the slide is disabled. Huh? Dirk? Yes. Uh, I can share the slide. Yes, you can. Oh, uh, no, no, no. I cannot. Uh, you cannot. Um, it's disabled. Uh, it's disabled. Oh, okay. One second. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Can you see this right? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, um, just a moment. Okay, so uh, uh, this is Hitoshi Asaida. And uh, today's talk is uh, uh, related to the, our CCN info draft. And uh, this is a uh, revision version four. And uh, we slightly updated uh, the who run previous versions. So the this is the summary of changes. The first one is a node identifier. Actually, um, we previously um, assumed that uh, node identifier can be an IP address, but uh, uh, according to the several comments, uh, we changed the uh, uh, node identifier assumption from IP address to node name, like a content name. The second one is uh, about information reported in sub blocks. In fact, it is not obliged for Lauda to fill all data in sub blocks um, because some Lauda may not implement complex function to obtain the required data, and others may not want to disclose everything due to its policy. So, but uh, um, it's not really, I heard it's not really clear. Threaten. Can you see this right? Yes, they were gone for for some time. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so anyway, uh, so we need to clarify that CCNFO allows to omit complex function implementations, and the third one is a regular interest and the full discovery request. So we also clarify the regular request, which is default, and the full discovery request, which is optional. And there are several editorial collection and improvement. So the first one, node identifier. The previous three uh, in a section 312 uh, regarding report block, we said uh, this field specified the CCN for user or Lauta identifier. For example, IPP4 address of the incoming interface on which packet from the publisher are uh, expected to arrive or all zeros if unknown or unnumbered. Now uh, we change uh, this statement, uh, this paragraph, to uh, the following uh, statement. This field specifies a node identifier, for example, node name or hash based self certifying name. Uh, number nine is actually the hop host uh, draft, or all the if unknown. This document assumes that the name TLB defined in the CCNX TLB format can be used for this field, and the node identifier is 
specified in it. The next one is uh, information reported in sublock. In a section 3211, uh, we clearly said note that some routers may not be capable of reporting the following values, such as blah, 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 uh, as shown in figure 15. Figure 15 actually shows uh, uh, the format, message format of re about reply sublock. And actually, uh, some, as I said, some router does not have uh, the capability of reporting these uh, counters or uh, values and so on, or some routers doesn't want uh, disclose uh, such kind of uh, information. So uh, these values therefore may be returned with you no. Know, we explicitly mentioned uh, about it here. And regular and the full discovery requests. So both are uh, uh, different, and we already discussed about uh, uh, the some supportive mechanism, especially for full discovery request. And uh, we want to keep the full, full discovery request as well, but uh, the default is a regular request. For the regular requests, in the regular request, the router forwards the request message upstream toward the publisher or caching router based on the fib entry, like the ordinary interest data communications. So if the other default Uh, protocol or mechanism, just uh, they can uh, work as a regular interest data communications. So they don't need to have some special behavior uh, for the, uh, request and uh, reply communication. But if the full recovery request is supported by Lauda, then uh, he needs to support various uh, additional functions comparing with, uh, compared with uh, ordinary CCN folder. So we explicitly say, unlike the ordinary interest data communications in CCN, if routers that accept a full discovery request receive a full discovery, oh, sorry, after the full discovery request, uh, the routers should, so I, I need to modify the statement. The router should not remove the pit entry created by the full discovery request until CCN if repair timeout value expires. So this is a common, uh, it's, this is not a common behavior. So uh, for the full discovery request, the data must support this special uh, behavior. But note that full discovery request itself is an optional implementation of CCN info. It may not be implemented on router. Even if it is implemented on router, it may not accept a full discovery request from non-validated CCN users or routers or because of its policy. If a router does not accept a full discovery request, it rejects the full discovery request as described in section 311 and the routers that enable full discovery request may rate limit reprise as described in section 10 or A as well. So we explicitly mention the difference of regular interest, a regular request and free required request. So this is a conclusion. Uh, CCN info is uh, compatible with CCNX. Uh, version 1.0 TLB format, and uh, it is a powerful network to providing various information in CCN. And the uh, CCN info implementation is uh, already included in a uh, CCNX uh, 1.0 compatible recording demo software named C4. So you can just download uh, open this open source, and C4 is a uh, uh, full scratch forwarding demo, and the uh, CCN info is uh, included as uh, as its uh, uh, unique too. And uh, as you see, uh, we need to uh, revise uh, several uh, editorial changes. So uh, we will submit the final revision in this week, I hope. And But uh, the content itself should be uh, feasible. And then I may ask the chairs to initiate a research group last call. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Toshi san. Um, just looking around, are there any questions? I don't. Okay, there's one from Colin. Hi, uh, Colin Perkins as an individual. Um, I just wanted to check, it wasn't clear, what was the relation between this and the trace route and ping? address. 
Um, well, maybe Dave can answer. Uh, actually, the, the CTNA4 is a much more powerful uh, network tool, and uh, it's not just uh, receive the uh, network statistic data, and it can also observe the uh, caching point and the various caching condition, like a lifetime and so on. So it's a, a more leech um, network tool. But it, no, the implementation could be very complex. I, so. I think the mental model, Colin, is that um, I see uh, CCN ping and trace route are like IP um, ping and trace route in terms of their capabilities and the, the and that and that they're intended as not just the management but also an end user tool. And CCN info is more like SNMP to get to you know some MIBI like things that are stored on routers. Forwarders. That makes sense. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, that, that that makes sense, but it, it didn't necessarily come across from reading the draft. Yes, Hitoshi, maybe one of the things we could work on together is to, um, for both the CCN info draft and then the ping and tracer draft, cross-reference with, um, you know, sentence or two saying what the relative uh, purposes of the of the work are so people can can go back and forth and see That'd be a good idea okay. to do okay. as part of uh, part of a version that goes to the last call yeah okay sounds good yeah okay and I'll point out that we haven't had nearly enough review on ping and trace route uh, for them to be progressing uh, very far yet um, so CCN info is is what we're what we're focusing on for for now until other people want to catch up on the other work. Okay, okay, I see. Yeah, I agree. Okay, any any more questions? Okay, then let's uh, clarify this um, with the next revision, uh, Hitoshi. Thanks a lot for the presentation. And um, we're now moving um, to the ICN low pen update by Sink. Yeah, all right. So I'm not able to share currently. Yeah, just a second. Ah, WebEx, come on. Hitoshi, can you stop sharing your? Okay, okay, just a moment. Well, the mucus is good. So, Dave, maybe you can uh, take away the printer role from Toshi. I, I can't do it. I, I tried to quit. <laughs> okay, that was put for us. <laughs> so, Cenk, I cannot make you presenter. Yeah, I don't know what's going on here. Dave, can you try? Can you try to make Shank presenter? WebEx doesn't allow me to do it. I can't even see him in the list of participants in the participant in the first permissions list. Hmm, that's strange. You can see Thomas. 
Bushy, Colin, Daniil, this is quite so open. Open. Let's see. Yeah, he shows up in the regular participants list. Not in this list. Uh -huh. So should I try to rejoin? No, no, no. Just a second. According to my thing, all participants have the privilege to share documents. So, <laughs> so can you try again? Something has changed now. So the button is still green. I can't click on the share button. Yeah, great. Try the menu share and say share content or share whatever. I have to drop the ball on them to let them present. Nope. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yay! Okay. All right, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right, thanks, Dirk, Dave, for the introduction. Uh, so, my name is Cenk, and I'm, or we have like the seventh iteration of the ICN Low Pen Draft. And here are basically the, I mean, we have like four little amendments to the draft from the sixth uh, iteration to the seventh iteration. Uh, they are kind of small, so thanks to Colin, who pointed out that the, the RFC 5740 three actually like demands to have like various notices in the abstract and introduction to identify this um, draft as a product of the IRTF. So we added a couple of uh, notices there. And then in mm -hmm. section 411, which basically describes how we allow um, extensions for dispatches, um, for example, in future drafts. And there we added a paragraph that future drafts should use uh, like structured manifests, like for example, in the flick draft, and we also put a link to the flick draft here uh, for the exchange of configuration parameters. And then the third amendment is that again, thanks to Colin, um, we added like some information about uh, which experimental evaluations could be interesting for for future uh, evaluations and how to how they would be fruitful for the ICN open work and how to advance uh, in this direction. So we added a couple of paragraphs there. And then last but not least, we added the IANA consideration section and we basically did a yeah, replace all and added a to be defined uh, text um, blocks in the document where we use like uh, the numbers. And then the draft itself was sent to IANA by Colin um, seven days ago. And basically we are now waiting for the response and depending on the response, then we would either need to update the IANA code points or the document will be sent direct to the ISRG for review. And that's the update. Very brief, thanks a lot. Thank you, Cenk. Colin yep. is in the queue. Please go ahead. Hi, um, so I, I haven't had a chance to share the response I got from IANA yet, but I will do so uh, either later today or tomorrow. Um, but the feedback we got from the, <coughs> excuse me, from, from the designated expert um, was that it seems to be consuming a, a lot of code points uh, and they, they were wondering if it was possible to uh, adapt the format to, to use a, you know, or less of the IANA registered code points. 
Uh, as I say, I, I'll share the, the details of that uh, as soon as I can. Um, all right. I think we have to look into that then. OK, thanks, thanks Colin. There's some discussions have been had, clearly. Yeah, OK. So um, just quickly, Marisha, say, um, I agree. Sorry. Um, it's great to hear you, hear you um, typing so actively, but um, I just had to mute you. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, no, no further questions. Um, then, um, yeah, let's move on, Cenk, uh, with the time TLD update. Okay. Let me switch the slides. Here we go. Do you see the slides? Yes. All right, thanks. So, in this particular draft, um, we talk about uh, time, like a compact time um, representation in the CCNX uh, protocol, uh, especially for the interest lifetime and the recommendation uh, lifetimes. First, <clears throat> there we had a version bump a couple of uh, weeks ago from, from 00 to 01, and we had a major change in section four, which talks about how we do the, uh, like the time encoding. And basically, we are now using the formula that is uh, based on the IEEE 754. This is the floating point specification. And thanks to Mark for this hint. And we added a couple of numbers, like sample values, to see how which values we get from the compression or which values are allowed to use. <clears throat> so the compression itself uses an 8-bit time code. So we have 8 bits. And then out of these 8 bits, we define 5 bits for the exponent and 3 bits for the mantissa. And I will show you why we took these values later. And we have um, two formulas. And again, these are basically the same formulas uh, taken out of the IEEE 754 specification. Um, for, I mean, the upper formula is for subnormal numbers. This is if you have like uh, an exponent of 0. We use the upper uh, formula, and um, if you have an exponent out of the blue range um, greater than zero, then we take the second formula. And the idea of having a subnormal range is that we close the the gap between uh, zero and this lowest number that the lower formula can can show. So, and just a quick um, like idea of why we took these configurations. I will now show you like, a sample configurations. And uh, yeah, we will see how they perform. Here in this graph, you can see on the x-axis the time code. So I said we have eight bits. So we go from zero to two 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 five five, and on the y-axis we have the time in seconds. So if you look at the configuration three five zero, which means we have three bits for the exponent, five bits for the mantissa, and zero is a bias that you can apply to the formulas um, to to the values itself. And in this configuration, we can see, okay, we have the red dots, and every, everything that, uh, between the red dots is the mantissa, or the precision itself. And every, every time we encounter a dot, we have an ex a mantissa overall, so we increase the exponent. So we can see we have a fairly large uh, precision here, but the range itself is really low. We only touch close to 1,000 seconds here, which is not enough for our use cases. If you look at another configuration, which is 440, so for exponent for mantissa, we can see that the precision itself is halved. So we have less precision, but the range um, is much higher. So we can almost get um, 10 to the power of 5 um, seconds here, which is a little bit more than a day. But a day is to, to less for our use cases. So we go one for, uh, further, and we have uh, five exponent bits and three mantissa bits. You can see that precision is again much, much lower, but we reach in this case a huge range. I mean, this is basically 100, I think 120 years we can uh, um, represent this configuration. But uh, then again, do we really need these uh, high numbers at the, at the lower end? And maybe we should concentrate more on the lower end. And this is what the bias is doing. If you apply a bias of minus five, this means we divide all values by 32. 
we, you can see the new configuration is just um, a Y shift on the Y axis down. So we have a lower range but we have more values in the lower end we can use. And with this configuration, we have a sub-second, I mean, we have millisecond resolution on the lower ends, and we go up until four years. We can reach three to four years uh, at this configuration, which is fairly enough for interest uh, lifetimes or recommended cache times. So there was another update uh, in the draft, which, um, handles the protocol integration. So we have this time, uh, the compressed time uh, coding, but how do we use this in the SCCNX protocol itself? And we said that we, okay, we will now concentrate in this draft um, only to the int um, on the interest lifetime and the recurrent cache time, um, which of course has the effect that the RCT, the recommended cache time is currently, it is an absolute time representation. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, the milliseconds since Epoch, Unix Epoch, and it's an absolute time. But if you want to use this, then we have to make the RCT a relative timestamp. So, okay, then we say in the draft, if we use the compressed uh, time, then RCT becomes a relative offset. And uh, currently we say the, or we opt for the solution that we say, if the TLV length of RCT or interest lifetime is one, yeah, the eight bits, then we say we use the compressed time. If it's anything else, then we use the same like specification that is in the CCNX uh, RFC. And here are alter alternative integrations. So instead of using this trick above, setting the length or looking at the length, you could also go with nested TLVs, which obviously have the um, like the pitfall that you introduce overhead, which is especially in the IoT case not not desirable. Um, or we could define new top level. TLVs, um, which have, for example, interest lifetime compressed, um, could, could be th that kind of a variant. And we could say, OK, instead of interest lifetime, we use interest lifetime compressed. The next steps for, the, for this draft are to further discuss these, this protocol integration. Um, we didn't get much feedback yet, but I hope that people have uh, more ideas on what would be the best way to integrate uh, this, this code points or the, the uh, compression into the CCNX. And then we have received a lot of feedback from Mark regarding um, how to improve, improve the, the draft itself. And he, he recommended that we put a, like all time values we can represent with this configuration to the appendix as a table, a huge table and also to provide a pseudo algorithm, how to convert from, from time seconds to the compressed time and backwards. Yeah, all in all, this, it's, it's actually a very simple draft. It's, it's not that long. And the question would be, are we ready to adopt this as a research group item or not? Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you, Cenk. Um, so be, before discussing that, um, maybe are there any technical questions? Okay, I don't see anything. Um, yeah, so just to make everybody aware, so this would be, um, say, the, the first um, update of the um, CCNX um, uh, RSCs that we were published earlier. And um, so in that sense, um, um, so we think it, it's uh, probably the right thing to uh, you know, give control to this to the research group and uh, adopt this uh, draft eventually. Um, is there any opinion, any feedback on that question? Okay, then what we'll do is we'll ask that question again um, on the mail list. Um, so um, yeah, the chairs are leaning towards adopting in the, in this, um, but um, yeah, let, let's um, see that whether, whether there are any other opinions. Thanks a lot, Cenk. Yep, thank you. And uh, now we're on, uh, with Dave on reflexive interest forwarding.
And Dave, are you still on the call? Sorry, I was muted. I'm trying to figure out how to get a PowerPoint directly shared. Share content, share file. Sound right. Here we go. Loading file. Loading file. Loading file. Yeah, looking good. So while it's loading the file, let me get started. So th this work grew out of um, some ICN research that the team that, that Dirk and I and a bunch of other people have been on for a number of years, looking at how to apply ICN in um, environments other than simple content retrieval. Um, and whether, whether these types of protocols actually ha are, are a good way to do uh, things like remote procedure calls and sensor networking and, um, uh, and other, other sorts of more computationally focused uses than just simply ask for some data and get it back. All right, how do I drive this? There we go. So um, the way the talk's going to go is I'll talk a bit about the motivations for why one might want to use multi-way interaction rather than just simple request response in ICN. Um, people have tried to do this in the past, so we'll go over some of the problems with the approaches people have tried in the, in the past. Then I'll introduce this design that we have for um, this facility called reflexive forwarding. Uh, talk a bit about the use cases uh, that we think this applies well to. And uh, depending on how well the things go, um, if there's time, we'll talk about some of the other things in the draft in terms of implementation and operation and security and privacy. So some of the motivations uh, for doing this is, is applications often need multi-way handshake. Uh, so things like any type of RPC or remote method invocation, not only do you have to invoke the method, but somehow the arguments have to make it from the client to the server. You have to have some way to perform authorization of the client. And in some cases, particularly for long-running computations, you'd like to separate the invocation of the, um, of the computation from the return of results. Second, second motivation is that you'd really like some way for sensors and actuators, why did this go backwards? Somebody did something with my slides. Okay, here we go. All right. They, they, they moved themselves amazingly. All right. Um, for sensors and actuators, um, we, we'd really like to see a way the data could be fetched from the sensors rather than just pushing that um, so that sensors don't have to be constantly waking up and that. Um, People who need the data don't have to constantly pull the sensors in order to get it. So, and Dr. Dave, 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 sorry to interrupt. Sorry, um, to interrupt. Um, sorry something um, wrong here with the slides. Uh, we still see the title slides. They're not really advancing. I advanced it. It's showing right on my screen. We advance and go back. Everyone has to advance. This is weird. Right. right. So, so um, the, viewer the viewer can advance the slides them themselves. Wow. Why is that? <laughs> Shall I try a different sharing way of doing this? Yeah, with window sharing and then everything's different. All right. Let me try that. There. Oh, great. Uh, that's grayed out. <laughs> well, let me do it. Uh, do you want clearing this time? We're going to content. Yes. Well, no, wait. Yes. No. All right. Now, share. Well, now it's all grayed out. I can't share anything.
Let me see what I can do. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. My old company that produces this uh, software. Dave, sorry, do you have an option to share PowerPoint in an application? Yeah. I don't see. I, I don't see. The, there's a button at the bottom right next to the camera for sharing, and you should have an option to share PowerPoint. Really? All right, let me try it. There's a button down. Yeah, if you look where the buttons are for camera yeah, and I, camera. Yeah, I, I, I have such a button, and it says share file or new whiteboard. Ah, uh, okay. It may be um, a macOS privilege uh, thing that you cannot share Windows on a desktop. Then I guess that's the only way we can do it. Oh, I can. I can share slides. Yeah. Why don't you do that? Yeah. One press. One second. Why is that? Are you not on macOS? I am, but. Probably a configuration thing. One second. Share content. Yeah, the only options are share file or whiteboard. Yeah, I see that now. That's strange. Data tracker slow. Okay. Okay, WebEx. By the way, you're the host now, right? I hope so. Okay. Okay. Can you see them? Yeah. All right. So, uh, Third slide. Next slide. Right. And then uh, I was on the last bullet of this slide to say that um, there's all kinds of cases where you need some type of peer uh, state synchronization. Uh, this is obviously well known because transport protocols provide three way handshakes and other protocols like um, for establishing multimedia sessions need multi way handshakes. Uh, next slide. Hello? Yes. yes. Next slide, yes. Okay. So um, people have tried to do these things with NDN and CCN in the past, um, but there are sort of like two classes of problems, one of which is that people wind up pushing a lot of data in interest methods. Um, and that, when they get really big, you might even need fragmentation of it. Of course, it gets pretty ugly, uh, since it has to be done hop by hop, and you need complicated and robust fragmentation protocols. And it also messes up a fairly deep assumption in the existing protocols that um, interest messages are small and congestion control protocols that people have designed for ICN definitely try to exploit that. And when the interest messages are no longer small, congestion control gets, gets messed up. The second is that if you're going to put important data in these messages, you're going to need to sign them or the, the the guy on the other end isn't going to believe the data in the interest that message. So that makes it even bigger. And of course, now it shifts a computational cost onto the producer to check the signature before it does anything with this data. And then lastly, if, if the computation or whatever is happening as a result of that interest gets abandoned for some reason, uh, you wasted all the bandwidth to push all that data. Uh, next slide. Yep. The other thing is, it, given that um, the protocols are, are independent two-way exchanges of requests and a response, um, if you have to construct a multi-way exchange out of these independent two-way exchanges, where the, the, the exchange in, is going in, the, one of the exchanges is going in the opposite direction, now somebody who's a consumer, um, with the assumption that consumers have certain uh, anonymity properties and um, initiator properties, now consumers need a routable name prefix so that the, the independent um, 
interaction coming in the opposite direction can reach it. This has some, a number of bad effects. It exposes the consumer to potentially unwanted traffic, puts burdens on routing uh, to propagate the, the, the routable name prefix far enough to reach this producer. And in mobile environments, um, where ICN has been touted as having sort of like natural consumer mobility, but has complexities which you need producer mobility, now all the consumers also become producers, and they need the producer mobility machinery uh, to be operating for them as well. Another uh, problem, of course, is that the consumer in these cases gets to choose the name it wants to be reached by. And um, as we've seen in many cases, uh, like FTP and other things in the IP world, if you allow a user to assert a name and hand it to a second party, expecting that second party to use that name, this opens up gigantic reflection attacks. Um, where a consumer can cause a producer to mount a reflection attack against anybody uh, whose name they can construct. And then lastly, just from a state, um, state machine point of view, correlating independent exchanges can be very error prone. And as we've seen in the case of key exchange protocols, this can be, of course, catastrophic. Um, and for protocols like multimedia, any of the, you who have lived in the world of SIP and SDP understand that the Getting the synchronized state machines of SIP going in one direction and SDP off or answer going in the other direction has been um, just a, a horrible mess for 10 years. Next slide. Yep. So instead, um, we are extending um, the two way exchange of, of, of NDN and CCN to allow for a reflexive exchange going back in the direction from the producer to the consumer. And this turns out to be quite easy because we can utilize the existing pit breadcrumbs uh, that are established by the interest sent by the consumer to the producer, which has enough state, not all, obviously not just for the returning data message, but to allow an interest message flowing back the other way to reach the consumer without having more routing machines. So we've defined a scheme called reflexive name prefixes which can be seen and understood only by those already in the established consumer pairing, sorry, pairing is the um, uh, that has been established by the interest. Uh, we also provide a FIB enhancement so that um, when these reflexive interests coming back the other way arrive at a, at a forwarder, it, it can use the existing forwarding machinery to get it back to the consumer. It doesn't need a super special code path to do that. And lastly, it directly couples the state of the original interest data exchange with the reflexive exchange. So the state get can, is easy to map correctly, both at the consumer and the producer, and unwound properly there and at the forwarders when the final data message comes back. Next slide. Um, so Dave, um, your audio is almost fading. I think you need to stay close to your microphone. Uh, I am close to the microphone. And All right. not, not change the distance. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm getting even closer. Now, uh, this slide had a really nice animation, so if I'd been able to use PowerPoint, um, it could have all been a lot easier to see. But I'll walk you through it very quickly. So if you work top to bottom with the consumer forward and the producer, uh, the consumer issues an interest message with its name, called the T being a certain producer, and includes an extra field of the interest message called the reflexive name prefix. Um, which has a value of, uh, noted here, of x1. I'll talk in a minute about how those values are defined. This creates two pieces of state in the forwarder, creates the normal pit. It also creates a special fib entry, which points back to the face that the um, interest arrived on from the consumer. This then arrives at the producer who can create the state that's used for its normal exchange, but also has some state that it can use to messages that are reflexive going back the other way. So this shows one instance of a reflexive interest going back through the same forwarder, creating a pit entry, and reaching the consumer. The consumer does what he does with it. He creates a data object that responds to that interest or has it already created from, a, from an earlier computation, returns that in the data message, which comes back, consumes that pit entry, reaches the producer, and then the producer completes the entire exchange with the original data message. So 
what we have here is um, normally a four-way handshake, and it could be turned into a three-way handshake if the, if the application doesn't actually leave the final leg of the change. Next slide. Okay. So the machinery for this is relatively straightforward. We define a new name component type, and remember, uh, CCN has uh, long had type name components. NDN originally had some uh, syntactical conventions for names and now also has um, uh, explicit name component types. So we define a new one, which then is, has to be the high order name component for any of these reflexive names and used to form the name prefix. Its value is a 64-bit random number. Uh, chose that to have enough entropy so that uh, you can identify the consumer with high probability um, for the duration of an exchange, actually much longer than the duration of exchange, certainly uh, for the duration of any reasonable exchange. And since we use a different value of this for each initiated intrastate exchange, uh, this limits any kind of linkability you can get from reuse of these identifiers. Um, so you can, you can construct a variety of different um, interaction uh, capabilities from this. The name prefix can actually be of a single full name of one object. Uh, it can be a prefix out of which the producer uh, and the consumer can name multiple objects. A good example of this is um, arguments to functions or remote procedure calls where the actual suffix names are uh, known a priori through the um, interface description of the, of the procedure call protocol. Or it can be the full name of a flick manifest. So if you need to fetch via reflexive interest a number of objects, uh, you can place those in a manifest. Next slide. So what does the forwarder do? The forwarder creates and manages short lifetime fib entries for any of these name prefixes that are in an in a incoming interest. They'll query those FIB entries and no others if an interest arrives the first byte name prefix. This is very easy. It's a one byte check um, so that you don't have to traverse uh, a full longest name prefix match style FIB entry for entries for, uh, for those things. And you'll see in the next talk on the NIST forwarder, there's some ideas they have for how to make that um, just as efficient as, as, um, as any type of hash lookup. Um, and then this FIB entry is consumed along with that PID entry when the data message is transferred by the computer. Next slide. So let's go through some use cases because I think um, uh, if you don't believe these motivating use cases, it's just a, a lot of change to the architecture to introduce um, uh, for, for no good reason. So we'll walk through three use cases. Uh, let's start with remote method invocation. Next slide. So, Historically, what happened was um, a couple of years ago, a bunch of us um, defined a whole pr protocol for doing remote method in invocation uh, using ICN. And in the process of doing that, part of the, um, the work was in fact to create a reflexive naming and a reflexive interest team. Uh, and though this spec is uh, slightly different from what we actually implemented uh, back then, the design is, is um, so we say aesthetically identical to what we had done there. So we use the, um, for remote method invocation, this is used for retrieving author authentication authorization information from the consumer so it doesn't have to be pushed. And a, a producer who doesn't want to talk to a given consumer can, um, can refuse to even ask for that information. Or if it asks for it, it can look at it um, as data messages which are correctly uh, encrypted and signed, and for fetching the arguments to the methods called. And you can complete this either immediately, once you've fetched the arguments and done your authorization, through by returning the result in the returning data message, or as Rice potentially can do it, by <clears throat> returning a, a name call of a funk, which is a handle on the results, so that the consumer can later pull for the result um, and, and if there's a long-running computation. Next slide. So this shows, for example, the, the operation of a single remote procedure call with two arguments. So the first uh, interest message invoked tries to invoke it. Uh, the producer then goes and issues two reflexive interests to fetch the arguments for the function. 
<coughs> excuse me, those come back. And only at that point does the producer need to commit any resources to the computation, at which point it can return a funk name to the, the consumer, perform the computation. The consumer, after waiting a while, there's a way to, um, in the funk to say how long the, the, the consumer should wait to ask for the result. It issues an independent interest to fetch the result, which then comes back. So that's how um, reflexive interests are used for remote invocation. Next slide. Um, we, so a number of papers in the early, early time of ICN pointed out that um, for RESTful web interactions, often the request message in, in HTTP is bigger than the response. And the, the papers published have showed that the, the asymmetry can be quite, um, quite dramatic. So what we'd like to do is, again, keep the request small by only placing the actual URI for the request in the interest messages, then turn around and get all the parameters, including any authorization uh, via reflexive interest, and all the HTTP group, uh, cookies, accept foo headers, all the other stuff can be retrieved with a pull from an uh, uh, a reflexive interest returning the data via um, a regular data message. Now this obviously compared with HTTP in theory uh, gives you an extra half round trip that otherwise wouldn't be needed. But then if you look at how HTTP actually runs over QUIC or HTTP, there are going to be multiple round trips due to TCP ACK uh, anyway. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, a third, I think, fairly compelling uh, use case is to convert sensors from push devices to pure pull devices, such that sensors only need to act as a consumer. They can wake up on a timer or event of new data being available and issue an interest message, which is effectively a phone home call to an application gateway or, or an NDN repo type of, of element. This in turn provokes a reflexive interest data exchange initiated back from the gateway toward the sensor. Now no longer needs a routable name prefix or any of that stuff. And the data can either be sent back directly as a data message to the gateway, in which case the gateway then has to construct its own data object out of that, sign it. Uh, or if the sensor is capable of doing so, naming, encapsulating, and signing the data itself. Uh, either of those two schemes work. I'll point out that in a lot of IoT applications, people care perhaps more about the identity of the gateway than they do about the identity of the sensor. And hence, it's perfectly okay for the, for the gateway to repackage the, the data coming back as an ICN data object with, its own, with a name relative to the gateway and sign and encrypt it uh, there. Next slide. Uh, so here's the example of uh, protocol ladder. The sensor can wake up. He issues a phone home to the gateway uh, as a producer who forms a reflexive interest requesting the associated data, goes back to the sensor, return, data is returned, and it, the data result is stored. And either you can complete a four-way handshake um, or you can just let the interest time out. Um, in the, in the draft, there's some suggestions about what interesting information could in fact be returned by the gateway to the sensor, things like perhaps how long to wait to wake up again, and also um, uh, the ability to keep time synchronized uh, correctly uh, with sensors that, don't, that have clocks that drift. All right, next slide. How are we doing on time? I haven't been keeping track of my time. Guys, <laughs> sorry, I've been keeping track of my time. Hello, hello? Yep. yep. So um, um, can we speed up a bit yeah, uh, so we have enough time? Well, I don't need to get through everything. Uh, let, let me talk just a bit about some of the implementation questions. But go read this, the draft, because it's very hard to summarize um, a lot of the stuff that's in there. Um, so for forwarders, if you have a low-end device that's only going to be forwarding a few thousands or tens of thousands of, of interest per second, uh, you don't really need to worry about this. Very straightforward implementation techniques will, will do the job just fine. 
But for a high-speed forwarder, and we're about to hear about one in a minute, um, you, you have to be very, very careful about both memory access and one of the things that this changes is the assumption that we have in high speed forwarders previously that FIBs were, mo were almost all read only or read mostly. And now we have something that op can update the FIB effectively at the rate of arrival of interest. So you probably don't want to use the same FIB data structure that you use your regular FIB for these. So the, the draft recommends a particular way to do a separate FIB called an RFIB that just uses a straightforward, really fast hashing algorithm in order to get, get the data. And when I looked at the slides on the next talk, you'll see there's another scheme proposed there that looks kind of nice too. Also, when, for when handling interest, uh, high-speed forwarders in general uh, don't, use, don't have a PID as a global data structure. They shard it in some way. So if there are any operations from reflexive interest that, requ that require or lookups or even worse updates across shards, that can be really tricky. So there, there are two ways in a high speed forward to deal with this. One is to just avoid cross shard updates entirely uh, or as, keep them as, as low um, frequency as possible or come up with a different scheme um, on the input um, side to force reflexive interest into the same shard as the original. Next slide. Um, there's also some interesting uh, interactions with interest lifetime because it's generally very hard for a multi-way interaction for a consumer to actually pick a good interest lifetime. So the draft suggests some ways that forwarders could arbitrarily inflate interest lifetimes to account for the execution. Um, so um, there's a proposal for how to do that in the spec, which also has some complications for high-speed forwarders, which are, in turn are also talked about. Uh, lastly, you know, interest aggregation is one of the big bugaboos of these architectures, and one piece of good news is that this all seems to work just fine with interest aggregation. Um, uh, a reflexive interest prefix is just another one of those fields in interest which causes you to not be able to aggregate interest if you create a separate FIB entry. Next slide. Uh, for consumers, um, you, the consumers change because instead of having these independent data exchanges and constructing names, you have a different sort of API and interaction for multi-way exchanges um, through with the with the um, rest of the system. Um, the choice the choices that a consumer has is when it re responds to a reflexive interest I already sort of mentioned, which is you need to use a plain data message if the lifetime of what it's returning is meant to stay inside the single interaction or you can encapsulate a whole data message with its own name. Um, if, if you're returning data whose lifetime is meant to survive beyond the existing exchange. And then you set the other fields appropriately for, for the data. I won't go into those details. Um, there is one additional complication because the state um, is in the forwarders for the producer to, to bombard a consumer with reflexive interest. It's nice for the consumer to be able to stop that if a producer is misbehaving, and there's a way to do that. Next slide. So I'll end with one piece of pretty bad news. Um, this is not backward compatible, uh, since you need an unbroken chain of forwarders to support this, or things don't really work very well. So we suggest three possible ways to overcome this backward compatibility problem. One is to ignore it, which I describe how you might get away with this, but don't really recommend that is the best way forward. Uh, we could bump the protocol version number, uh, which deals with it very nicely. Anybody adding that TLD would have to bump the version number, and then back forwarders would just reject the interest. Um, so that's really simple, but it's a really big hammer. Um, and we want to think carefully before we pull that big hammer out. And then the third, which is my personal favorite, but also the hardest to accomplish, is Let's create a capabilities exchange protocol so forwarders know the capabilities of the next hop so they can decide whether to forward something on the next hop or not, depending on the capabilities of that next hop. But that, of course, requires a whole new set of work to construct such a protocol. Uh, next slide. I think we're about done. Uh, the protocol encoding changes, that's the simplest part of the whole thing. It's one new TLV um, with a TLV type. 
and a 64-bit integer. Uh, next slide. So for security, I think it's important to point out that one of the big motivations for doing this work in the first place was to improve security. And it's motivated by improving both security and privacy by avoiding payloads and interests that then have to be signed all the associated vulnerability or computational attacks on producers. It avoids routable name prefixes for consumers so they aren't exposed to attacks of various sorts. And it avoids sending names that can be crafted by consumers uh, to producers, which can open up reflection attacks. So we view this as actually an improvement to security over the existing uh, ways people have tried to make these capabilities happen with ICN. Next slide. So a few things to consider. One needs to at least talk about the possibility of collisions on reflective interest name prefixes. This is easy to deal with if you happen to have a crypto quality pseudorandom random number generator, and we basically say, yes, you have to have one. Uh, you're going to need one for your crypto algorithms anyway. So just ensure that your 64-bit uh, your random values are actually produced by a crypto quality random number generator. These do produce extra resource pressure on the PIT and FIB, so they're more expensive on compute and memory, so uh, you may need some resource allocation algorithms in your forwarders that um, put these in a separate resource category so they don't overrun simpler requests. And lastly, from a privacy perspective, you know, we're, we're in the same world of privacy is hard for ICN protocols because they leak names. Um, and this is no different in that regard. Um, we don't think it makes it any really worse uh, because the names are only exposed on the path back. On the other hand, the use cases we're proposing have uh, interaction patterns, which says that a surveillance uh, attacker can observe the interaction pattern uh, either through timing or uh, or message capture, and potentially um, produce linkability information just based on the interaction pattern. Now, this would obviously be true even in the absence of reflective forwarding. It's only to point out that if you start using ICN for these more complicated multi-interaction uh, use cases, those interactions have patterns that can be uh, detected by surveillance uh, and produce and I think I'm done. Uh, next slide, I think, is the final slide. Yep. Okay. I'm done. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Yes, there's one yes, there's by David. 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 Um, um, the RMI, RMI example, example, you had multiple, multiple reflexive, reflexive interests. I think there, 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 there was a slide by the example. example. Um, how uh, can you how multiple, multiple reflexive, reflexive interests for one, for one um, exchange, um, exchange. For, for one for outer one exchange? exchange? Well, the, remember, what, what, what's sent from the, in, in the consumer to the producer is uh, the first name component, which is just a prefix. So the producer can add suffixes to that to retrieve as many data objects as he needs to, or add a suffix for a flick manifest that then returns uh, other things and initiates more reflexive interest exchanges. Okay. okay. So from, from a previous from slide, slide, I thought there was a uh, prefix, uh, prefix or whatever it's called, whatever it's called that, that was consumed as the first of such terms. No, it's only consumed by the final data message going back. Okay, thanks. If, by the way, if there's something in the draft that isn't clear on that regard, please review it and send me comments. Um, I mean, this is, you know, a zero, well, there's a zero one out because I respond, I worked with Ken Calvert on a bunch of stuff that really, I think, improved a lot of the exposition. But again, this is pre fairly preliminary work. and you know, needs a lot of review and thought by people. We're going to continue to work on it if there's interest in the RG. Okay. Hey. Cedric, Thanks, Cedric, everybody. Cedric is in the queue. And Dave, you really Dave, have to mute your mic while, while someone else is talking. Hey, uh, 
uh, I was just curious, what happens to those um, entries in the bid if you just do it through a handshake? Do you leave them time out, or are they open for anybody to use? And what's going to happen to that? You had this like in in the early slides. You were talking about those. You were showing a four-way handshake, but you said that oh, but it could just be a three-way handshake if we we uh, don't send the last message. I was curious what what kind of percent may use those. Uh, well, it, it just times out like it just times out like any other interest data exchange. Don't respond to the interest. I don't actually recommend that for almost any of these use cases. Um, but some people, you know, there may be cases where the cost of the extra bandwidth to send the final response is sufficiently high compared with the cost of keeping the state until it times out makes the trade-off in favor of the timeout. And you can decide one way or the other depending on what your use case or application is. Okay, I'm, I'm closing the, the virtual line here because we really have to move on. Um, so, um, just real fast, hey folks, if you have more questions, just fire them off via email on the list to me, and I'll try to be responsive and answer them. Yeah, so we will be running a bit over time today. Um, I hope it's not, not a big problem. So um, next is uh, Jun Xiao um, with a presentation on an uh, NDN DPDG forwarder. I think because the host has to share the slides. Um, I can make you present on, let me. Okay, that's better. Now it should work. Can you try? Yes, yeah. you, you can see but, it. Okay. Yes. Uh, I am Jun Xiaoshi. I'm uh, I'm a member of National Institute of Standard Technology, and today I am presenting the NDN DPDK forwarder. NDN DPDK is a NDN forwarder over native Ethernet without using any overlays. Our goal is to is line speed forwarding on commodity hardware, and so far. We have achieved 106 gigabits per second between two ports. And the forwarder's design has a parallel architecture so that we can use multiple CPU cores to process traffic. The forwarder has efficient data structures in pre-allocated memory pools. Then by using DPDK, the data plane development kit, uh, we can use the user space PCI drivers with hardware offloads. Also, we are designing disk-based caching on NVMe drives, and we are investigating the potential of FPGA acceleration. This diagram shows the architecture of the forwarder. Uh, it, uh, it's divided into three stages, each are some threads or C pinned to CPU cores. On the left, left side is the input stage. The input thread will receive packets from the hardware Ethernet interface and decode them, perform NDNLP reassembly if necessary, then determine which forwarding thread should handle them by doing name lookups and other dispatch methods that I will explain later. In the forwarding stage, the forwarding thread implements the, the NDN protocol. It will process interest data and NAC packet according to the protocol. And each forwarding thread it has a PIT and a CS composite table, and it has the FIB. And there are also crypto helper thread and the disk service thread to assist the forward forwarding threads. In output, uh, the output stage, output thread will perform uh, packet uh, NDLP fragmentation if necessary, then schedule the packets for transmission onto the Ethernet adapters. Uh, first, I explain how the FIB works. Uh, the FIB lookup, we use two-stage uh, longest prefix match algorithm. 
This algorithm is inspired by an ANCS 13 paper, named the data networking on a router fast and DOS resistant forwarding with hash tables. Uh, other than that, we, uh, other than that, I designed the rest, which are the new things. So the management, if management wants to update the fib, like insert or remove next hops, it needed to do it through RCU read copy update. This is to achieve thread safety. Then each fib entry has a pointer to the forwarding strategy. Forwarding strategy is a function that it determines how to send, uh, how to forward the interest. And the strategy will have opportunity to observe when the data comes back and then store the measurement, such as round trip time of each next hop. The measurement is stored on the fib entry, and therefore the measurement granularity is the same as the fib, fib entry. And one strategy needs to update a fib measurement, it can do so without going through RCU for efficiency reasons. But this also means each forwarding thread needs to have its own fib partition so that multiple forwarding thread or multiple strategy cannot update the fib entry at the same time, which would be unsafe. Uh, for the pit, pit we have pit sharding. Uh, we have pit sharding algorithm. So each forwarding thread has a private pit instance. The pit itself is a hash table, and it's implemented with non-thread safe data structures, which is somewhat more efficient than the thread safe counterpart. Uh, but because of pit sharding, there are two requirements on interest dispatching. First is Two interests with the same name, they must go to the same pit because this is required for interest aggregation. The second requirement, if their multiple interests has the same name prefix, not the same name but sharing the prefix, they also should go to the same pit because this is needed for effective strategy decision since the forwarding strategy operates on namespace granularity. They collect the measurement like that. So the solution is we dispatch the interest by the hash of its first two name components. So this is how it works. We have in the input thread, we have the name dispatch table or NDT. NDT is maps from the hash of name prefix to a forwarding thread ID. NDT is thread safe. It is an array of atomic int. And, and because the key, the map key is the hash, so many name prefix would share the same entry. In the input thread, when the interest comes in, the input thread will compute the hash of first two name component. Of course, the number is configurable. Then uh, using the hash value, it will take the lower, the lower usually, suppose the NDT is 64K entrance, then it will take the low 16 bits of the NDT, of, of the NDT index, then it will find where where that entry is. If that, that Inside of that entry is a forwarding thread ID. So in this example, the, the NDT entry says the, the name prefix corresponded to forwarding thread one. So it goes to forwarding thread one. And then the interest goes into that pit. Um, pit but pit, this kind of pit sharding, it also has implication on data dispatch because the data and the NAC must go to the same forwarding thread that forwarded the interest since other pit do not know about the interest. Uh, normally, I could use the same name bit dispatching algorithm, but there is a corner case that where name dispatching stops working uh, because in NDN, there is a prefix match. So when interest, suppose I have interest name slash A, just one component with also the can be prefix element, then that interest will go to, will go to the NDT entry determined by the hash of slash A. But when the data comes back, the data name is AB1. It will go to the, ND, the forwarding thread found in NDT entry of hash value of slash A slash B. And these two NDT entry could point to different forwarding threads and then, and then name dispatching no longer work in this case. So the solution is we introduce a hop by hop header field called the PIT token. And then we use that PIT token to associate interest and data. PIT token is an opaque token that encodes forwarding thread ID and the PIT entry index. Every outgoing interest needed to carry this PIT token. It is a 64-bit field in the link layer header or in NDN, it's called NDNLP, and it's hop by hop. 
Then with the data and the neck, when it comes back, the upstream node must put the same pit token in, in, the data, in the NDLP header of data and the neck. And then using the forwarding thread ID portion of the pit token, uh, it's here. So forwarding, so suppose, suppose the pit one forwarded the interest, the pit token has forwarding thread ID, part is one. It goes to upstream. When it comes back, the data also need to carry the same pit token including this forwarding thread ID. Then back in the input thread, it's, it will be able to, to the input thread that can look at that byte and see, oh, pit one handles the interest, so we dispatch it to forwarding thread one. The rest of pit token is used for accelerating a pit lookup. It's used to accelerate pit lookups, but it's not required for correctness. Uh, then, then we then we go to the content store. So con uh, content store is a hash table, but in NDN we we have to support a prefix match. One of the NDN design principle is in network in network name discovery. The interest should be able to use incomplete names to retrieve data packets, but the hash table doesn't support a pre only supports exact match. It doesn't support prefix match. So our solution is introducing indirect entries. And so this here is an example. Suppose I send the, I send the interest AB, but the data come back is called AB1. In this case, I am going to insert two entries to the CS. The AB1, it, this AB1, it's, it is the data name entry, and then it, this is called a direct entry, it, and it carries the data packet. I also insert an indirect entry called AB. AB is named after the interest. So the assumption is when when consumers want to use name discovery, it will be using the same interest name to do name discovery. So if the consumer want to find it, usually the consumer will always send the interest name AB. It's not going to send a slash A. And in that case, when the next interest is named either AB1 or AB, it can find this CS entry because it's in the hash table. But in case the next interest name is is slash a. It cannot find it. It has to be sent to the producer. But I hope this does not happen because that's assumption. Okay, go back to the input thread. So we have we are using some some of the hardware offloads supported by the Ethernet adapters. But today most Ethernet adapters only support ISS rules, receive side scaling rules that matching on Ethernet and IP header fields. And so far, I have been using it to support creating multiple faces on the same Ethernet adapter and distinguished by the MAC address. Uh, the preliminary benchmark shows that when I have more than eight forwarding threads, the input thread becomes a bottleneck. And also, if the, if the, the server machine has two CPU, two NUMA socket, and the traffic need to cross NUMA socket, the NUMA boundary, it will reduce throughput by between 12 and 25 percent. So, but the current ISS rules are not powerful enough for, for eliminating this bottleneck, so we need better ISS rules. Uh, I also found that some NICs, they support eBPF and FPGA, but the products are very limited, and the development cost is quite high, especially for FPGA. Basically, each chip has needs a separate development cost development efforts. But what I wish that the Ethernet adapter could support in the, in the dispatching, in the in the filtering functionality is first it I hope they can match they can match or offset into the data portion of the Ethernet frame. If I can get that feature, I will be able to distinguish interest versus data. And then in case the packet is a data I can also use the hardware to read the first octet or the forwarding thread ID portion of the PIP token. Then I can place the data straight to the forwarding thread on the correct NUMA socket. So there is somewhat fewer NUMA crossing when it's being forwarded. Uh, but of uh, implication is this could need minor changes to the hop by hop header fields, but it does not affect the network layer at all. And also, I wish the NIC can support a randomly dispatching to multiple queues so, so that I can use more than one input thread to decode and process interest from the same NIC in parallel. But ultimately, is I hope NIC can 
the Ethernet adapter can understand the sum of the NDN semantics, but that's uh, um, 10 years from now, or more than that. Uh, next up is the support for implicit digest. Implicit digest is an NDN protocol feature. It allows the interest, the final component of interest to be the SHA-256 digest of the whole data packet. And the forwarder will need to do digest computation on the data packet in order to determine whether the interest with implicit digest could be satisfied. But digest computation is slower than all the regular forwarding workloads. So it's so I cannot really do that in the forwarding thread. So what so the solution is introducing a crypto helper thread. When the for, when the forwarding thread when the forwarding thread receives an interest that and it or a data and it determines that the digest computation is necessary, it will pass that packet to the crypto helper thread, ask the crypto helper thread to compute the digest then forwarding thread can continue with the next packet. So in the crypto helper thread, uh, it, it will invoke the DPDK crypto device. It could be software like OpenSSL, or it could be hardware like Intel Quick Assist. The, the crypto device will compute the digest, and then the packet comes back to crypto helper thread, and then we use the normal dispatch method such as NDT or PIT token to redispatch the packet to the forwarding thread. And the forwarding thread can process this packet again and with the digest already carried in its metadata. NDN DPDK also supports the forwarding hint. Forwarding hint is a routing scalability solution. Uh, in the example up there, uh, the interest name is unroutable because, uh, but uh, the forwarding hint can have one or more routable names. Then, then in, the, in the forwarding thread, uh, we will we will look up the FIB first with each of the forward delegation names in the forwarding hint. Then the first delegation name found in the FIB is called the chosen forwarding hint. Then then we can forward the interest according to that FIB entry. And and also interest with different chosen forwarding hint cannot be aggregated in the pit. This is to avoid the scenario similar to cash poisoning. And then in, for the data, data will be matched to the PIT entry using the PIT token. So I know which forwarding hint brought back the data because of the PIT token. And also to prevent cache poisoning, content store of each uh, chosen forwarding hint is also logically isolated. So if two interests with different chosen forwarding hint, they cannot aggregate, they cannot um, be satisfied by cache at all. Uh, finally, I have some ideas for re reflective forwarding. It does not mean I committed to do it. It's just if if I am to implement reflective forwarding in my forward architecture, what I would do. First is is the suggestion for the reflective forwarding draft says I need to update the FIB from forwarding thread. But if I'm but since I have RCU and I try to do RCU from forwarding thread, it would be too slow. So I think I should just skip the FIB and use only the PIT to determine the forwarding path. Then I want the reflect interest to contain the PIT token of the original interest, but not in the name, it's in the forwarding hint. And this doesn't mean that this forwarding hint, the PIT token in the forwarding hint will change hop by hop. But a benefit is the reflective interest and also the data packets, they can have normal names. They don't need a special name component in the front. They don't depend on consumer being able to generate good random numbers. And they don't require the, the original consumer to encapsulate the data if the original signature is important. Then in the, then in the forwarder, the input thread will the forwarder will be able to identify an interest is a reflexive interest because the the forwarding hint uh, the forwarding hint start with a reflexive component, and then it can the input thread will dispatch with this forwarding hint in, instead of computing the hash of the interest name. Then for the forwarding thread, it will find the pit entry of the original interest using this pit token. And then it also needed to verify the current reflective interest matches the reflexive name in the original interest. 
and the con original consumer did not prohibit further reflect interest from being forwarded. So here is the blue one is the original interest data exchange and the yellow one is re reflexive. We can see the blue for PIT token on the upstream side, upstream will put the same PIT token in the forwarding hint. Okay, the last page is the references. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So there are a few questions already um, by Dave. So Dave, why don't you ask your question again? Well, I'll take the second question offline, but the first one was, let's say I create an object uh, slash A slash B slash C slash D slash dot 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 slash Z. So there's 25 named components. Does that mean if I want to enable prefix lookup, I need 25? One for each possible prefix that somebody might want to look it up by? Are you talking about the CS? Yeah. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, doesn't, it doesn't matter what your data name is, but I will only create one indirect entry, which is the interest name. I don't create them, I only create one. Which one do I, let's say I have an object A, B, C, D, E, you know, 25 name components, right? What's the interest name that retrieved this object? Oh, I, oh, I, I, uh, so I, I, I give a, I give an interest for, say, A slash B. As a prefix lookup. Uh, I'm only I'm able to look up, up if the, the second the interest is, has, the has the same name as the first as interest. interest. Otherwise, Otherwise it's, it's, the CS will miss. Well miss. But then you're not doing prefix lookup. Uh, yes. uh, is in other words, uh, if I set, send an interest for A slash B slash C for this big long thing, and I have an A slash B slash C slash D slash E slash dot dot dot. dot Yes, this is a partial. That should, be re that should be returned, right? Because it uh, matches. Uh, yes, but uh, uh, this uh, cannot, cannot match, match because, uh, because the assumption is, is the assumption is the consumer should be using the same interest name to discover the data name. No, you should be using a prefix of the data name to discover it. Uh, but, uh, but uh, in, reality, in reality, the, the application will be using the consistent prefix. Really. Usually, Usually, the, the name, name ends with, 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 with the second, and the consumer will use the name that uh, without the, the last two components. So, so, so the name the used by consumers is highly predictable. Let's take it offline. This does not match my understanding of prefix lookup in NDN. So Lisha, so Lisha says, says, it seems you can can. We lose audio. Yeah, some, some something happened with me. Like it, sadly. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I did not hear any question. Yes. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a discussion here uh, on the uh, Webex chat, and um, so Lisha was asking, um, or was um, saying that uh, you can just simply use forwarding hints to support uh, the, the reflective forwarding function. And um, I was saying that, uh, yes, but then you have to accept the fact that both parties have to expose throttable names. And uh, you can see the discussion in, in, in the, the chat here. So any, any more questions uh, on the uh, NDN DPDK forwarder?
Okay, um, then uh, thank you very much uh, for doing this. Um, super interesting. Um, so we move on to our um, last presentation, um, and that's Anil on um, um, their QoS uh, approach for ICN. And I'll make you presenter just a second. And you have the floor. Hi, hello everyone. So I'm Anil Jangam, and I, along with Prakash uh, Sutar and Milan Stolik, we are uh, presenting the QS uh, approach for the information centric networks. And we have released uh, uh, posted the last update, which is zero two. And uh, here are the updates of the changes. So. What we added is about the discussion of the network resources to be controlled, and uh, and mainly those are link, uh, content store, and public memory that is split, and the, the compute. Uh, in addition, uh, we have also described uh, some initial uh, uh, um, points on the how the QoS treatment types uh, are going to be and what network resources they influence. And uh, some of this work is is. Uh, having some overlap with the the QoS work that is done for the IoT by Sense team, and uh, uh, we, have, we have referred to their work as well, and as well as uh, David also publishes uh, or or you know uh, QoS architecture draft, and we have a lot of feedback also received from Dave, which we have incorporated here. In addition to that, uh, we have introduced the QoS marker uh, into a hop by hop header. Uh, our initial uh, or the zero one draft was uh, talking about QS marker as a as a name based encoding, and uh, we received some constructive feedback from Dave about uh, some of the potential challenges uh, involved with that approach. So we have, uh, have another op option using hop by hop header, and then depending on the feedback uh, uh, from the community and uh, some of the experiments that we are doing, we will decide which we which way is the more better and or advantageous. Then we have the improved bit scaling design, uh, in which case uh, the, the marker uh, state information is now stored as part of the interface rather than as an explicit entry. So this will help to reduce some, some of the bit load that is going to create. And I'll, I'll explain a couple of use cases why, what I mean by that. And we talk about uh, 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 some introduction to the QoS remarking scheme. So we had discuss about this uh, in the in, in the initial uh, presentations and then we will make it more uh, uh, more explicit now and then especially by how by how by how better in encoding the remarking uh, scheme is feasible now and finally we have some editorial uh, improvements made in this draft uh, as as for the feedback we received So uh, this table summarizes the QoS treatment types and the network resources that in the, that influence. And I said it is, uh, uh, it is the, this has some overlap with the work done by the IoT team. And here we define the resource type as link capacity, the content store capacity, the forwarder memory essentially it, and compute capacity. And the plus plus sign here kind of indicates as an increased uh, resource as far as that particular uh, type of uh, treatment is concerned. So let's say in reliable delivery, we need more uh, CPU utilization, or there will be more queue utilization and cache utilization, and so on. So and uh, and then various other uh, uh, treatment types listed here will have the corresponding. Uh, I mean, this is again initial uh, uh, projection. Uh, we are working on some of the experiments which will we have where we will have more uh, uh, clear uh, data or understanding. And in this case, the QS modeling uh, or the treatment modeling is is the trade-off of things where the ability of, of you know handling number of traffic classes given the the total amount of memory we have, let's say on the pit or in the cache, and the and the processing capacity, and the second is the trade-off between the 
ability to express the type of QS treatment, uh, given the protocol encoding uh, uh, ability and the al algorithmic implementation. So now, what we have seen in traditional uh, IP world is, you know, we have only limited uh, TSCP codes, whereas uh, in NDN we can have uh, more space to encode the QS treatment. Now, whether we need just, uh, you know, let's say six digits or more, you know, let's say one byte or two byte, it, it, it depends on like how how expressive the QS treatment can be, and then uh, that is where the the TLV based approach is more. Uh, Providing more and more, providing more opportunities. Uh, this is the proposed uh, design for the TLV encoding for the hardware based uh, QS mark. And we introduced uh, it as a, we would like to introduce as a mandatory hub by hop header just to make uh, the, the semantic of this header that it is, it has to be forwarded uh, by every router to the next hub. So that every you know the, the the downstream router has the opportunity to see what the QS treatment is uh, intended by, by the or original consumer, and then it acts on it. And right now we are uh, we are proposing it as a one byte field, which is like eight bit QS field. And uh, depending on the type of treatments and then combinations, we will see whether one one byte is enough or you know how we can break it or maybe make a use of uh, two bytes and so on so that we don't have final clarity on that as as yet moving to the next slide uh, in the qs of a forwarded design or the pit design as we said uh, earlier in the original draft uh, we were having an explicit entry for every qs uh, marked or you know duplicate interest with having different qs markers uh, now we have changed it to you know interface based um, um, state security. So the QS marker will be saved as part of the interest uh, data structure rather than the the explicit bit entry. And the interface data structure it can be enhanced to save the QS marker. And there are two use cases uh, which we already documented in our previous uh, uh, submission. But uh, just for the sake of uh, completeness with the newer design of this uh, interest in the bit. Uh, I'm just reiterating those two use cases here, and one is the case where you know we received duplicate interest with higher QS markers and received on the same interface, and I'll explain how this is possible. And the second use is about you know receive interest. So when I say duplicate interest is the interest with the same content name, and uh, the second interest that is received having the highest uh, or the QS marker. Uh, but received on a different interface. Now look at this, uh, you know, pit entries. The interest one uh, is received on, both are received on phase one, but one is the interest one is having the QS marker one and QS marker two. And the QS marker two is the, is the high priority interest compared to the QS marker one. So in this case, we will be forwarding the second interest as well. And this is where the, the pit aggregation relaxation is, is going to take place. This is is going away from the 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 well known aggregation mechanism of the pit here, but this is the, the uh, this is the we I I don't want to call it as a limitation, but this is the price maybe we will have to pay for the uh, implementation of the QS because this is a possibility. Now, and and the only uh, the, the 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 other aspect is that only in the lowest lower QS marking will be aggregated. Uh, but if some some interest comes with a higher priority, then that will be forwarded, even though a pending interest is already exists, but with a QS uh, lower QS marking. And as far as that QS data delivery at uh, is concerned, the data delivery will be handled based on the the QS marker state that was say, saved into the PID. So we don't have to have the you know the QS treatment which was like going. Uh, in, to the upstream uh, routers using uh, through an interest that need not come back into the data packet. So that 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 one uh, you know change that is you know we are doing here. So the pit entry in QS marker depending on on which interface that was received. If it is the packet data for uh, data packet was forwarded on the downstream interface with the highest uh, QS marking recorded at the interface, then it will go with. It will go with the the data packet will go back to the downstream uh, router 
on the, using the higher QoS marker. And in case two, if data packet is forwarded on the downstream interface with the actual QoS marking recorded at the each interface. So now this is the case where the same content is uh, is having two different entries, and this is where that relaxation of uh, you know pit aggregation the case that I talked about in the previous slide. And finally, in the um, uh, I mean, which I think I have not mentioned about it, but the the remarking case of uh, uh, which I mentioned in the initial slide, the QoS remarking scheme where uh, traditionally what is happening the at the AS boundary of the, the administrative domain boundary or maybe between two routers, if router decides to remark the QoS for whatever reason, the upstream router now doesn't have the uh, you know track or the you know knowledge about what was the original QoS that they intended by the QoS consumer. So it is always working based on the previous router's uh, uh, projection, projection of the remarking case. So in the remarking, the original uh, QoS marker is also preserved, as well as the intermediate router can now remark it and then still forward both the uh, QoS markers to the next uh, next router, so that uh, the the next router can decide whether based on the the remark QoS or based on the uh, original uh, intention. So that is the the final uh, change that we are talking about. And so we will discuss more about this remarking uh, scheme as well as the protocol encoding uh, in, into our next uh, submission. So we will uh, uh, we are looking for the more feedback and more comments from the from the group. So far, we received good amount of comment, very constructive feedback from Dave, which we have incorporated into this work. And now uh, Luca has also agreed to review this draft, and uh, we will take it from there. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Anil and uh, co-authors, for continuing this work. Um, yeah, so it seems. Um, yeah, are there any questions? Yeah, I don't see any. Um, so it seems that um, draft um, has been getting some uh, feedback, and um, so there has been some uh, discussion on the mail list. So it would be great if we could um, continue this. And um, so in general, the, the, the whole QS topic is, of course, um, really interesting. And um, so I think there we have kind of seen that there are different approaches. And um, yeah, let's continue working uh, on the technical work uh, in the group here. Thanks again. Uh, just a quick uh, injection here. I noticed a bunch of people have already signed up for reviews um, on the Google Sheet. So <laughs> I'm encouraged it may actually be working. And thank you all of you who volunteered to do reviews. Okay, um, yeah, this brings us to the end of um, our agenda. Um, so um, just uh, two quick um, comments. Um, so as we have seen today, it's um, um, kind of doable to hold uh, meetings like this um, using online um, tools, um, but we, sh we shouldn't um, kind of uh, only use WebEx. So uh, we, we still have our mailing list, um, so please really use that. Uh, I mean, we, we can get a lo lots of useful work done. Um, and there, and then, as they said, please help with the draft reviews. Um, and um, yeah, um, and kind of improve the technical quality of the work and uh, keep our documents evolving. Um, with respect to future meetings, um, well, as you probably noticed, uh, it's a bit unpredictable um, what's going to happen. Um, so we could imagine that there's at, at least one other uh, online meeting we are uh, going to hold. Um, but really, let's not um, wait for these um, synchronous meetings so uh, we can um, spin off uh, new work uh, on the mail list and, and um, 
but direct uh, communication as well. So let's uh, uh, just keep doing that. Um, yeah, thanks for um, staying with us. Um, sorry for taking a bit longer. Um, please stay safe, everybody, and hope to hear you again soon. Bye bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you, bye.